And he has proven so faithful in our life. But before I do that, if you guys would join me in prayer, I'm going to stop going to the Father and pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace in our lives. We thank you, God, that you are so present with us and you are a God that, that loves us unconditionally. Thank you for this time together that we can look into your word and learn more of who you are, that we can worship together and praise you for the opportunity to do that. And God, we thank you that you are with us right now. We pray that in this time together we're, we're closer to you, <clears throat> that we would learn more of your love and just have the time to experience what it's like to be in your presence. And so you name that we pray. All right, well, as I was thinking through this, I was thinking about the time that I came to Cumberland myself as a student, and that was in 2002. And I stopped for a minute and thought, some of you were probably actually born in that year, or after that, and then I wanted to stop thinking about that for a while. <laughs> uh, how many of you were born, like, in 2002? Okay, so if you, anyone, like, after 2002? Okay, yeah, so I was in college, and we were being born. <laughs> but I'm a college grad myself from Cumberland, and I majored in religion, which is now called missions and ministry. And um, the way I got to Cumberland, I was raised in what I often call a semi-Christian home. Um, my mother was an incredible woman, is an incredible woman, that raised us in church, bringing us to church every time the doors were open. She was in charge of our children's ministry at the church. But my father was um, distant at best, very absent in my life, did not follow the Lord, and that was very clear in his actions in his life. So um, on Sundays, I would have one experience with my mom in the church. Then the rest of my days, I would have a very different experience. Um, being in my home with, with my father. So about the age 10 is when I began to realize that I was a sinner in need of salvation, that the only way for me to have a relationship with, with God was through what Christ had done on the cross for me. And actually the absence of my father kind of pushed me toward that more because I wanted that love <clears throat> and acceptance that comes only from the father. And every day on, on Sundays at church, I was hearing that Jesus was the way to experience that. So when I was 10 years old, I put my faith in Christ. And I think like most kids kind of so I went along with that for a while, but then as I got into high school, I actually changed churches because there was no youth group in the church that I was in before, and I really wanted to start growing and learning how to study my Bible and go deeper in faith. So at that youth group, the ministers there were really intentional about teaching about discipleship, and that was the first time I ever heard that word, even though I was raised in church, I didn't really know what discipleship was until I was there. Um, the ministers there took me aside and showed me how to really read the word and go deeper in my faith. And it was in those years that the Lord began to call me into ministry. I didn't really know what to do with that at that point, but I knew that I needed to go to an education about that. So that's how Cumberland um, came into view. It was a Christian college, so I close to home from Somerset, so just about an hour away. So I came to Cumberland, and I think like most of you, probably at this moment, sort of had these dreams for my life, almost like the Christian version of the American dream. I was gonna meet my spouse here, we were gonna have you know, 2.5 children, and all those types of things, then probably adopt from overseas, like all these plans that we had. And I began to trust God with those plans, as I was told to do them. But then as those plans began to fall apart, so to say, they didn't quite, quite turn out the way that I thought they were gonna turn out, or this picture that I had in my head that, that was the way that it should go. I began to really have to learn how to put faith in action. It was times in life that I began to question, do I really believe what I say I believe? Do I really believe that God is good all the time, no matter what's happening in my life? And those questions began to happen my freshman year, actually, in Cumberland, my father passed away. And not only was it a loss of my father, it was a loss of like hope of what that relationship could be, because it was never what I needed or wanted it to be growing up. And that sort of sent me on this journey of, okay, everybody keeps telling me God is so good, and things are gonna work out, it's gonna be okay. And then it seems to be the kind of title of the decade of my 20s, a series of unfortunate events, because it seemed like it started with the death of my father, and then just more and more things began to happen. And some of that's typical as you age, like the more life you experience, you realize life is just hard, unfortunately, because it's a broken and fallen world. I did meet my spouse here in college on a mission trip. Um, we began our, our marriage really focusing on the Lord, really wanting to build a family. Um, a couple years into that, I experienced a miscarriage, which was really uh, very painful for me. And it took years um, after that, we began having issues with fertility, and then we decided that we would adopt. Um, my son is eight years old now, but he was adopted at birth. Uh, so we're kind of going through the adoption journey with him has a lot of bumps along the way as well. He's 80 now, but you need to ask a lot of questions. He's biracial, so he doesn't look like the rest of our family. So he's asking all kinds of questions. Um, so even now, kind of walking through that with him um, has its difficult days. A couple of years into, after adopting my son Ben, 
um, experience the deepest abundant maturity you can experience and the covenant of relationship. I began really questioning, is the Lord good? Looking back over these 10 years of just hard stuff, things that I couldn't really begin to make sense of. And I had put on my mirror these verses um, that I was going to watch every single day, read every single day to make sure that I kept putting truth back into to my life. I put them on my kitchen window where I was washing dishes every day. I put them above where um, my son's changing table was because I was generally either changing diapers or washing dishes um, or like in the morning getting ready. So I would see these verses every day. And one of those verses was Romans 8 to 28, which is a pretty popular verse that we tell other people or we tell ourselves when things are going rough in life or we want to be comforted or reminded that God is good and all things are going to turn out for the good of those who love and are called according to purpose. So I'm going to read that verse for you right now. From Romans 8 to 28. So Romans 8, 28 says that we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purposes. And I would read that verse every single day, every morning, as I was washing dishes, as I was changing diapers, um, trying to remind myself, I know that's true, I know that's true, that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But right now it doesn't feel very good. In a stage of life where I was a single mom for many years, working full-time in ministry and trying to figure out how to balance all those things, it didn't feel good. And there was one day that I felt the Lord, just the Holy Spirit, tell me, read that verse from my perspective, not yours. And for a minute, I was kind of taken back, like, well, what do you mean, read it from your perspective, like from God's perspective? I think a lot of times we come to Scripture reading it from our perspective. What do I want this verse to mean for me right now? What do I want it to do for me almost right now? So when I read that verse, that all things work together for the good of those, who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I would read it as in, like, somehow this is all going to be okay one day. Like, somehow there's going to be restoration, there's going to be redemption, there's going to be, you know, flowers, butterflies. It's all going to be okay, because that's what, you know, that's what I think good is in this situation. So in the times of our life that we're having really difficult times, we have an idea of what good looks like, of what it should be, or how, how we thought it was going to turn out. But when the Lord spoke that to me and said, read it from my perspective, I began thinking, well, actually, all of Scripture is from the Father's perspective, when we get to look at it from the author who wrote it. So when I read that verse from God's perspective, I have to ask myself the question, well, from God's perspective, what is good for us? From my perspective, often good is, like I said, just the situation working out how I feel like it should or what makes the most sense in the situation. Our good in God's perspective is for us to grow closer to Him and become more like the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. So when I began reading that verse from that perspective, I began to see... This is all working for his good. I've never been closer to God in those moments that things were so hard that I had to begin to really see Jesus as that shepherd that he tells us that he is, or the bread of life which I believe you're learning about today, that sustenance that you need every single day. We say those things, we read those things, but it's often in the hardest times of life that we realize that's really true. He really is our bread of life. He really is the resurrection. He really is all these things that you're going to be learning about for the next few weeks. When we begin to see scripture from his perspective, it begins to kind of all make sense. That whatever we're going through, you know, it may not look the way that you want it to look or feel the way that you thought it should feel, but God is working it together for more good. We sometimes forget there's a greater plan outside of our lives as well. And that as he's refining us, and as that he's redeeming different things in our life, it's changing you, it's making your faith deeper. You experience God in a way that you've never experienced them before, and then you're able to help others in a way that, that you weren't prior to that situation. So my prayer for you is, especially in college, as it's the first time that you're on your own, or maybe some of you are like getting ready to exit and be like on your own, on your own. And you start to experience things in life that don't make a lot of sense, but not going the way that you had hoped that they would go. That you begin to read that same verse, Romans 8, 28, from God's perspective. Is this really working for my good? And I think you'll see that you can trust his promises that yes, it is. It's growing you closer to God, deepening your faith, and allowing you to minister to other people in a different way. So I hope that maybe some of you will post Romans 8, 28, where you're at every single day, and begin to look at that from the Father's perspective and let him change the way that you're seeing Scripture, the way that you're seeing him moving and working in your lives. Thank you guys for being with you today, and I'm excited to experience the rest of with you.
Lord, we come to you today just so grateful for who you are and we love you so much. I pray for Jacob as he gives a message today that your word is spoke through him, Lord, and I pray for all those who are here today and that we leave knowing you better and just forming a better relationship with you. And I pray for those who couldn't be here today for quarantine and everything, Lord, and I pray over that, that you please keep our campus safe and healthy as can be, Lord. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it is exciting to be with you all again this week in chapel and just to really press in and continue with our study in the book of John, just really diving deeper into the question of who is Jesus, right? And so if you weren't here last week, just to kind of provide a brief overview of the whole point of this series, the whole point of diving deeper into the gospel of John is really, truly to challenge do you know Christ? Who is he? Who is he in your life? Do you desire to know him and know him more? So if you do know him, if he is in your life, if you are saved by Christ, if you have life in Christ, then you should desire to know him more and more as you grow in your faith, as, as he continues to work in you. And so that is a lot of what this series is about, is just looking at that idea of who is Christ. And so... Uh, Last week we looked at, looked at John chapter 1, and I gave a disclaimer to begin the, the whole series. I'm giving that disclaimer for the series, but also for today, that uh, John, at the end of John, in chapter 20, he really does kind of give this summary of the book. He begins to summarize, he says, and this is John 20, 30, and 31. He says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples. That are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And what an what a encouraging thing that John is saying at the end of his book is that by reading this gospel, you're not going to know everything about Christ. You're not going to know everything that he's done because he is, he is God, and he is fully man and fully God, and that we should desire to know these things about him, the end goal is that we would come to life in him and that we would live for him as a result of that. That's the reading of the gospel is that first it would convict that it would draw us to the Lord and that we would come to life in him and then that we would live for him. And so again, so many things in the book of John, so many things in John chapter one that we went through very quickly but didn't get to go into everything in detail. And I challenge you over the last week, read through John chapter one again, read it for yourself. We're, we're picking up in John chapter six today. So we've skipped several chapters. Um, we've missed Jesus's first miracle. We've missed uh, some of his other miracles. We've missed the feeding of the 5,000 even. And so that is actually where we're about to pick up is right after the feeding of the 5,000. We're going to pick up in John chapter 6, verse 22 is where we're picking up. And the verses should be on the screen. If you have your Bible, though, it would be beneficial to follow along there as well. And it is a long passage today. There's a lot in here. And that's part of the disclaimer is we're not going to get to touch on everything. Right? We're not going to get to explain everything. But since it is a long passage, I don't usually do this. But if you would stand so that we can focus on the word of the Lord. Starting in verse 22, and this is after the feeding of the 5,000. It says, the next day, the crowd that, that had stayed on the other side of the sea knew, where, knew there had only been one boat. They also knew that Jesus had not boarded the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone off alone. Some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they ate the bread after the Lord gave thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum, looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I assure you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, 
which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set a seal of approval on, you, on him. What can we do to perform the works of God, they asked. Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. What sign then are you going to do so we may see and believe you, they asked. What are you going to perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written, he gave them bread to eat from heaven. Jesus said to them, I assure you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives the, you the real bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said, Sir, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one comes to me, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me, and yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do the, my will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Therefore, the Jews started complaining about him because he said, I am the bread that came from heaven. They were saying, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? His father and mother we know, how can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, stop complaining among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will be, all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. I assure you, anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for him, the life of the world, is my flesh. I see that. We will unpack some of this. There is so much in what we just read. We're going to unpack some of those verses and then we'll continue and finish the reading and kind of see the response of the crowds. Uh, but before we even begin unpacking, I'm going to pray for us. And I just pray that as we look at the word, you would not get distracted by how much there is, but that you would press in to hear the word of the Lord. Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you are um, sufficient, that you have provided everything that we need, that you have provided Christ, that those who are in him might have the hope of life, Lord, that um, those who were once dead in sin are brought to life by the work of Christ. And Lord, we just praise you for that. We pray this morning that as we wrestle with what it means that Christ is the bread of life, as we wrestle with what it means that all who are drawn by you uh, have life in you. Lord, we just pray that as we look at those things, that we would not desire to be filled by anything of this world or by anything of ourselves, but that we would desire to be filled by you, to be brought and live in life in you. Pray these things to your glory. Amen. So for us to fully understand and appreciate this text, we have to take in the fact that there is a lot of context that we skipped over. The first 21 verses of John chapter 6, two major things happen. The first is the feeding of the 5,000, that Jesus has had compassion on this multitude of people who were listening to him teach. And his disciples even begin asking, shouldn't we send these people away? Or how are we going to feed all these people? Right? And, and you all know the story. It's familiar that because of the five loaves and the two fish, that Christ blesses those and then begins to feed the entire crowd and the entire crowd crowd is fed to the point that they're full and have leftovers, have 12 baskets full of leftovers. 
Right? And that in and of itself is such an amazing miracle. I think often we're so used to hearing that story that we just don't take in how miraculous it is what Christ did there. But from there, afterwards, his disciples go on ahead of him over to Capernaum, and the Christ goes to pray. He goes off to pray, and he joins his disciples later. We actually miss another miracle by the context that we skipped. We see that Christ not only fed the 5,000, but afterwards, when his disciples begin to cross and they get caught in a storm, Christ walks out to them across the sea to them and joins them and saves them from that storm. He calms the storm. Two major things just to give us some context of what's going on. But then that next morning, the same crowd who was filled, those 5,000 who were filled by the uh, bread that Christ gave, they were wondering, well, will he do it again? If, if we come again today, maybe he'll give us more of that bread, right? Maybe we'll see another miraculous sign. We'll see another miracle. And when they find him, they begin asking him questions. How'd you get here, right? They put two and two together that, well, the disciples left in one boat, and only one boat's gone, but you're here, right? And so they're, they're confused, and they're asking questions. But here's what's significant. They ask this question, Rabbi, when did you get here? Right? They're, they're kind of teasing out, wait, did we miss something? Did we miss another miracle? Did we miss something that you've done here? Christ doesn't even answer that, right? Like he, he does answer it, but he doesn't answer it directly with, well, I walked across the sea. And he doesn't answer it indirectly by saying, well, I'm here now, aren't I? No, he says, I assure you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. So Christ is saying, hey, don't be amazed that I'm here. Don't, don't pretend to care that I'm here because really what you're looking for is not me, not Christ himself, but the things that Christ gives, right? That, that bread, they enjoyed that bread. They were impressed by the sign and they were wondering if he would do it again. And, and Christ goes straight to the heart and cuts straight to the heart. And he says, I assure you, you're not looking for me but you're looking for what I've given you. You're looking for what I offered you. And that really does bring us to just a very sobering reality that Christ knows the heart and that he challenges the heart of man. He challenges the crowd's heart. So we've seen so far that the crowd searches for Christ. And then second, that Christ challenges their heart. He knew their true desire. He knew that they were not desiring to know him. He knew that they were not desiring necessarily to enjoy him, but they were desiring to enjoy the miracles. They were desiring that bread that had filled them. Their minds were on physical things, things of this world, not on Christ himself. And he challenges that. And what's amazing about his challenge there is that they haven't, they haven't expressed that, but he knows their hearts. But even when he gives this rebuke, when he tells them, he says, you're not looking for me for the right reasons. And then there in verse 27 even, he says, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which is the Son of Man, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. Christ is offering them eternal hope, even right then. He's saying, look, stop looking for the things of this world and look instead for the things that the Father is offering. Look instead for eternal life in me, is what Christ is telling them. But the crowd, even with that, is still distracted. They're still distracted by what they would prefer, what they would like. They're not so interested in what Christ is offering, which is eternal life, which is hope, in him, they're interested in what they can do for themselves. And so get this, their next question is, what can we do to perform the works of God? Essentially, they've shifted the conversation. They've said, all right, Jesus, if you're not going to give us more bread yourself, right? If, if that's not what's going on here today, then just tell us how we can do it for ourselves. Tell us how we can make the bread come. Tell us how we can do the works of God. We saw the power that you have. Give us that power. And isn't that so often the response of the world and the response of many that when we see Christ and we see the beauty of what 
he offers in the cross and the resurrection. We kind of miss the point and we're like, well, what about spiritual gifts? And what about um, what it looks like to have status in the church or status in society? We start missing the point. Often the world does that. And so the crowd here has moved from, will you give us more bread? And Christ says, no, that's not what this is about. You're looking for the wrong thing. You should be looking for me instead. They ignore that. And now they're asking, well, if you're not going to give it to us, give us the power to do it ourselves. If, if you won't give us the bread, then we'll just go around you. Just give us the power so that we can take care of ourselves. What's Jesus' response, though? Verse 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. All right, so they've asked Tell us, teach us how to do the works of God. And he's saying the work of God, the most essential thing, the will of the Lord is that you would come to him, that you would believe in the one that he sent, that you would believe in Christ. That is the work of God. And that is the work of God in anyone's life. And Christ expands here in a second. I won't get ahead of myself. But what sign then are you going to give us? So they start asking. They're like, all right, if you won't give us bread and you won't give us the power to do it ourselves, then what else are you going to show us to make us believe that you're real? To make us believe that we should listen to you? You know, if you're saying that the work of God is to believe in you, then show us. Make us believe. And so they even bring up to them, to Christ, they're bringing up, they're saying, well, Moses, when we were in the wilderness, when our ancestors were in the wilderness, Moses gave them bread from heaven. Right? He gave them manna, and they were able to eat and be sustained in the wilderness. And Christ immediately addresses that. He immediately challenges them for asking for this sign of manna. The crowd has fundamentally misunderstood what manna is and what's its purpose. So we see here, Christ says in verse 38, he says in verse 32, he says, I assure you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the real bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to this world. So again, the crowd has absolutely missed the purpose of manna, the source of manna. They, they have ascribed the source of manna to Moses, right? Moses gave us the bread from heaven, right? And our fathers ate of it. Christ is saying you've missed the point. And what's what's interesting and what's kind of ironic about this is the word manna means what is it, right? So the Hebrew word means what is it? They were confused then and they are confused now. They see the manna, they see the provision of God, and they mistake the provision of God for the work of man. They mistake the provision of God that God gave manna for the work of of Moses. And if you're familiar with the Gospels and Scripture, you see again and again that one of the Pharisees' arguments is we're children of Abraham, right? That we've been taught under Moses. That is one of their arguments is the heritage that they have in the patriarchs. But Christ is challenging that it's not Moses and Abraham. It's not Isaac and Jacob. It's not the patriarchs. It's not your heritage, but it's the work of God. It's his provision, his providence, his sovereignty. And so even from there, we see here that Christ goes even further, right? So, so we've seen this progression that they come, they're, they're excited to see him there. They're hopeful that he's going to give them more bread. He says, you're looking for the wrong thing. You're looking for the things that I give instead of me. So then they're like, well, just enable us to do the things you do and we won't have to worry about it. No, the will is that you would do, that you would come to the Father through Christ. And, and so again, then they're distracted and they say, well, then give us a sign. Why not give us manna like, like, uh, like our father, like Moses did for our fathers? Christ pushes in further. He says, after he's 
offer the bread of life, their response is, sir, give us this bread always. And so they're kind of, again, focusing on the physical things, thinking, well, if there is this sustaining bread, if there's something more than the manna, if you can give us something even better than that, then that's what we want. We want to be filled. We want to be sustained. Christ then makes this statement that just swings the pendulum of the conversation. From that point forward, we see the, the conversation shifting. Christ says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life, Christ tells them. And there's something significant about the way this phrase is structured. I am is how Christ begins. And that's part of why when we ask the question of who is Jesus and we're answering it through the book of John, we call these the seven I am statements of Jesus. We're really looking at Christ proclaiming who he is. And that statement, I am, is the same statement that God gave to Moses when he said, who are you? He says, I am, right? So God is, I am. And so the Israelites would have known that I am is equivalent to claiming to be God. And so from that, the, this conversation is shifting. They've heard, okay, you provide the bread. We want that bread. Give us that bread always. And now he's saying, no, I am that bread. I am the sustainer. I am the one who is accomplishing the will of the Father. And he goes further. He says, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry. No one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me. And yet you do not believe. Christ again is saying, you've seen everything you need to see. And yet you still don't believe. You've seen me. You've heard the truth. And you're still rejecting. And then he really gets to the heart of the matter. He says, everyone the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven. Not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Christ is making a promise there, and he is explaining to them that he is the one who sustains for eternal life, that he is the only hope, that he is the only one who they can come to the Father by. And that the way that that happens is the drawing of the Father, that they would hear and respond to the truth. That they would believe in Christ. And have life in him. And it's a beautiful assurance that we see here that Christ is promising that he's not going to lose anyone who comes to him. That those who are in him, that those who are receiving him as the bread of life, that they will have the promise of eternal life. Not because of their own work, but because of the work of the Father that he's accomplishing in Christ. And that is a beautiful promise. What I really want to challenge is go back and read the promises of Christ in this passage. Read what he is truly saying again and again this week because it is so beautiful that we see Christ is saying that he is going to accomplish the will of the Father. And the will of the Father is that he would not lose anyone who comes to him. That the Father gives him. So I encourage go back and read that and meditate and pray over those promises. To get deeper in that would be a whole sermon in itself, and so we won't, but I just want to challenge again that the ultimate thing that Christ is saying here in answering the question of, of who is Jesus, he is explaining here that he is the bread of life, that he is the sustainer, the giver of life by accomplishing the will of his Father in that. And that all who come to him will have eternal life, and he will raise them up on the last day. What a beautiful promise. And again, Christ has been throughout this conversation, he's been kind of systematically addressing their hearts, addressing the way that the Jews and the Jewish leaders were approaching him. Right? They've gone from this physical desire for just to be filled with bread again. They've gone from that to, well, give us the ability to do the works on our own. And they've gone from that to, well, we want that bread. And now he's told them, I am that bread. Let's see their response. Therefore, the Jews started complaining about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Again, that was significant. 
he's, he's made an I am statement now. So he's equated himself to God in that way. And now he is telling them again that he's God. His origin is heaven, that he's come down from heaven. And so they're putting two and two together that Christ is claiming to be God. And they were saying, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can we, he now say, I have come down from heaven? They thought they knew him. Right? And we even discussed that in John chapter 1, right? When, when Jesus calls Philip and Nathaniel, Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And so Nathaniel thought just because of where he was from that he knew him. And we see again here this mistake, this miscalculation of people who think they know who Jesus is and what he should be. The, the Jews are saying here amongst themselves, you know, he's, he's the son of Joseph and Mary. He's, he's the son of people. How can he be God? He's from Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? They're trying to wrestle with that. They've rejected the truth that Christ has given them here. And they're beginning to wrestle with it themselves. And what I really want us to draw out is that often in the world we live in today, people will say, we know who Jesus is. Right? They'll say, we know that he was known for his kind works, for the good things that he did to people. He was a good teacher. He was a loving person. He was all love, all kind, all good. But they don't want to know the truth. They don't want to know who Christ really is. They don't want to actually know him. They just want his things. They want salvation. Right? They don't want to go to hell, so they want heaven. But, but they don't want to know more than that. They want healing, right? Everyone wants to be physically well, but do they want to actually know Christ? They want prosperity. They want things to go well for them. They would love to see people be more kind and at peace with one another. But just because those are some things that people know about Christ, that doesn't mean that they know Christ. And that is such a struggle for the world we live in today is the stumbling block of, well, here's what I know about Christ is that he should be kind and he should be loving and he should, if he's so good, then why isn't the world better? These are the types of questions that people who think they know Christ will ask. They don't actually know who he is and therefore they don't know him. Because to know him is to know his father and to know his father is to obey him. And we see that throughout the book of John, and that is what Christ is drawing out here, is that he's doing the will of his Father, which is to reveal his Father to the people. Christ being all-knowing and perceiving their conversation, perceiving their doubts, their, their reservations, their uh, claims that they know who he is and where he's from, Christ addresses it. He addresses it further. He says in, in the next set of verses, he says, stop complaining among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will be all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me. Christ is he's, he's calling it out there. He's drawing it out. He's saying that if you truly have heard the word, if you've truly been called by the Father, if you've truly understood him, then you would understand me. And that is something that was a major stumbling block for these Jewish leaders is they were the authority, right? They felt that they were the authority on who God was. And he's saying that if you actually know my father, you've been taught and you really truly understand the scriptures and the truth, then you would come to me. And Christ offers again this promise and this hope of eternal life in himself. He says, Everyone who has listened and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Again, himself, he's explaining that. And he says, I am the bread of life. Again, he, he's repeating his statement now. He's saying, I am God. And I am the sustainer. I am the one who gives eternal life, eternal sustenance, the things that we need. And he gives again this promise that your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. He's, he's telling them, your fathers, that manna, it was temporary. You, you might have equated it with the work of Moses, but it was the provision of God. And now God is providing something far greater. 
This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Christ, again, is, is foreshadowing his own death, foreshadowing that he will give himself that they might have life. But he is also calling to the present reality that if they would trust in him, if they would come to him, if they would be drawn to him and obey, then they would have that eternal life, that hope in him. Let's see, let's further see. I, there is so much in this passage that we could take a lot of time. I, I know that we can't spend time on every single thing, so we'll keep moving. But I again encourage you, go back, read this for yourself again and again. If you've not read the book of John, go back, read the whole thing, and then slowly study through it. Look at it, wrestle with these things. Be in conversation with one another and be in conversation with the body of Christ. But we see here that the Jews continue to argue. They continue to reject what Christ has taught them. At that, the Jews argued among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? We see something else that is significant for the Jews of that time, but also significant for the world that we live in today that is so often still in rebellion, that there are so many people still in rebellion. We see for the Jews, when they hear this statement, that if you take and eat of my flesh, you'll have eternal life in me. Clearly, Christ is speaking figuratively. He's foreshadowing his own death on the cross, that that would be his flesh that would sustain and that would give life. And that if they would come to him, that they would have that life, that sustenance in him. But beyond that, they take it into their own hands and they take it into their own context and they try to literally figure that out. Well, are we supposed to eat? This man, like, are we supposed to go cannibalistic? Is that what he's calling us to? They're not listening. They're hard of heart. Hard of hearing. Because of their hardened hearts. But they begin asking these ridiculous questions of, well, are we just supposed to eat him? Are we supposed to become cannibals? And obviously that is not what Christ is saying here. And he, he continues on. He says, I assure you. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Because my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. And it's not like the man that your fathers ate, and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. Christ, again, is showing them the truth of who he is, right? We're answering the question of who is Jesus? He is the bread of life. And so now he has explained that to them three separate times. He said, I'm the one who came down from heaven, right? I'm the bread of life that came down from heaven. He's explained that to them on multiple occasions. And he's called again and again to say, if you are not in me, then you have no hope. That the only way for eternal life, the only way for hope is in the bread that the Father has provided. And that's Christ. Explain that multiple times to them now. We see now, and this is the part where we'll spend some time and we'll get some practical applications and implications of how we respond to this. See, starting in verse 59, it says that he said these things while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Therefore, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were complaining about this, asked them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some among you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who would not believe and the one who would betray him. He said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. From that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. So I really want to take a minute 
to let that settle in, let, let you see what, what has just occurred. So Jesus, up to this point, has been doing all of these signs and wonders, these miracles. He's, he's been healing people. He's been providing for their physical needs. He's been teaching them. But in this moment, he is teaching them. He is stating to them, I am God. I am the one who is here that you might have eternal life. I am the promised Messiah. And again, keep in mind, for the Jews, the, the idea of the coming of the Messiah was a big thing. But they had so many twisted understandings that they could not understand the truth. He was saying, I am God. I am the one. I'm the one that was promised. They miss it. What's significant is his following was huge. I mean, these people had come back for day two, hoping for round two of a feeding. But when they hear this teaching and they hear the fullness of it, it says that many of his disciples, many of those who had been following him, many of those who had been there for those signs and there to see those things and there learning from him, they begin to turn away when they hear the full truth that he is God, that he is the bread of life. That he is the one that if they would just partake of him, they would have eternal life. So many turn away because it's a hard teaching. And here is the reality of the world that we live in, is that there are many who love the things of Christ. Just like these people love the fact that they were fed and they were filled and had this great feast the day before, they love the things of Christ. In the sense that most people in this world, if... If they believed in heaven and hell, would say, yeah, I want to go to heaven, not hell. Most people in this world would say, yeah, I want kindness, goodness. I want healing, physical wellness. I want all these things in my life. But they do not want Christ. And so just as for much of that crowd that had been following for the things of Christ, the good things that they could experience, when they heard the truth about who he was, they turned back. Because it meant no longer relying upon themselves, no longer desiring to sustain themselves, but to become entirely dependent upon Christ as the bread of life. And that was a stumbling block for many of his followers then, his nominal followers, those who were coming and seeing the good things, but were not truly believing. And it's a stumbling block in our world today that many like the idea of Christ but will turn away when they recognize that it means to be fully dependent upon him. To take of the bread of life, to not live for themselves, but to truly die to self and follow Christ. See in verse 67, though, the response of the genuine followers, of those who have been drawn by the Father, of those who have come to that life through Christ. It says, Therefore, Jesus said to the twelve, you don't want to go away too, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, who will we go to? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus replied to them, didn't I choose you, the twelve, yet one of you is the devil. He was referring to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, one of the twelve, because he was going to betray him. So, Again, we've covered so much today, but we see here in this last encounter with his disciples, he says, all right, so many others have deserted. So many others, when they heard the truth, have deserted. What about you? Are you going to be one who turns away? Or are you going to be one who presses in? Peter's response is, Lord, where would we go? You're the one who has eternal life. You're the one who has everything that we need. And so again, the challenge here would be for you. Are you living in such a way? Are you living in such a way that you know Christ or that you just want his things? Are you living in such a way that you would say that even though this way is hard, it's narrow, it is so hard, even though the truth means that we have to lose our sense of self-sufficiency. It means that we have to stop saying that we can do anything to justify ourselves. Are you one who would continue striving, or are you one who has died to yourself and taken of the bread of life? So do you know Christ, or do you just want his things? Do you just want salvation? 
Because if you just want to be saved in the sense of, I, I want to go to heaven and not hell, then that is not the truth and the message. That's not the fullness of the gospel. The fullness of the gospel is that those who are dead in sin are brought to life by the work of Christ. It's not just a matter of heaven and hell. It's a matter of death and life in him and the work of him. Do you just want the community? Do you just enjoy being around friendly people and, and the things that come with being in Christian community? Or do you want Christ himself? Do you just enjoy the fact that on Cumberland's campus it's so easy to be in Christian community and it's easy to fellowship and to enjoy that? Or are we being sustained fully by the bread of life, by Christ himself? Because the reality is that for many of you, once you leave this place, you will never have a community that looks quite like this. It, it's so much more difficult to find Christian community outside of a Christian campus. And so when it comes to that, will you rely on the bread of life? Will you press into Christ or will you turn away? It's a genuine life in Christ is the one that obeys him, the one that follows at all costs, the one that sees that he is the bread of life and knows that it, that is all we need, not anything of this world. And so that brings to like the second application is, is there anything you're trying to be filled with that is not Christ? So is there anything other than Christ you are seeking to be filled by? And that can be relationships. That can be friendships or romantic relationships that we're constantly trying to, to fill ourselves and fill ourselves up and be sustained by those things. But the reality is that if we are not sustained by the bread of life, then all those other things are meaningless. They will be just pits for our time that distract us from our desperate need for Christ. Maybe it's media. Maybe you're constantly feeling this need to watch or listen to something or to read something or just to be filled with knowledge instead of Christ himself. Maybe it's some sort of status thing. You just have this need to feel a place of belonging, this need to feel a place of uh, position on this campus, but you're not interested in Christ himself. So is there anything other than Christ you are seeking to be filled by? And if you are, Repent of that. If you're truly in Christ and he is the bread of life, then leave those other things. Lay them down. Say, Lord, take this. I want you. So then the, the final question for those who are in Christ, are you being sustained by his flesh and blood? And the true answer is yes. But then the reality of the way that works out in our life is, are you learning the truth? Are you growing in the truth? Are you spending time in his word? Are you spending time in prayer? Are you seeking to know him more? Are your affections deepening for him? Do you desire to please him more? Are your desires changing? You know, are, are the things of this world becoming less appealing and the things of the kingdom of Christ becoming more appealing? Is your obedience increasing? Is, is the Father through the Spirit, are you being drawn to live a life that looks more Christ like. So, so again, if we are being sustained by him, then we are also growing in him. That not just the hope of eternal life, but that he is working that out in us. He is the one sustaining us, not just for the resurrection, but for this life. He is sustaining us to be conformed to his image. So again, I just want to challenge you all. I know that most of you in here are those who are probably following the Lord. You're not the ones who have turned. But if you are, if you are struggling with that and you're asking that question, then I really challenge press in. Is he the bread of your life? Is he the sustenance of your life? Or is it just the things of him that you're trying to fill your life with? But if you are truly his, if he is the bread of life, then continue to grow in him because the bread of life is sufficient for all things. Christ is sufficient for all things. We will never be hungry or thirsty. We will never be lacking because of the work of Christ completed on the cross and the work of the Spirit in those who have come from death to life. So trust in that promise. Take hope in that assurance and press in further in a life that is growing in obedience to Him. 
if you take nothing else from today, I pray that you would ask this question, is he the bread of my life? Is he the bread of life? Do I know him as the bread of life? So I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll, we'll finish uh, worshiping. I just encourage that if you need to pray after we pray, just continue in prayer. The altar's open. There is an opportunity just to worship, not just in singing, but in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness, your mercy, for your provision, just for Christ. Lord, we just pray that, um, Lord, even though this is a hard teaching, even though it is, uh, was hard for the Jews to hear and it's hard for this world to hear, we just pray that uh, you would continue to draw people to yourself and that they would respond in obedience. Uh, Lord, that we would truly accept you as the bread of life, that we would live a life that reflects the sustenance that we have in Christ. Lord, we praise you for that, your glory.
thanks everybody for coming out for chapel. Um, Christ really is the bread of life. And one of the things I was just wanting to encourage us uh, is that the bread of life sustains. Um, and one of the things you'll realize, especially as you get older, uh, is that sometimes life is really difficult, right? And I'm sure that some of y'all are facing some of those things now, but even in the midst of those difficulties, the bread of life sustains. So I want y'all to take comfort in that. Uh, Jesus is who he says he is, and he comforts his saints. So go in peace. Thank you. 